Access granted. Access granted. Access granted. So we'll, we'll start, we'll kick things off here. Um, maybe as we, uh, just as a little disclaimer, and before you two sort of introduce yourselves, uh, which we'll kick things off with, I will. I would like to say this. Obviously, as someone who is in uh, marketing, has spent a lion's share of his professional time in tourism before coming to tech, um, I am totally going to understand every single piece of tech you discussed today. But in the off chance that I don't, I might jump in and ask for a, a sort of layman's version of any technical content you share, just in case anyone that happens to watch this video uh, needs the same thing. It's not for me. Again, it's not for me, definitely not. It's for anyone out there that might watch and might take a better understanding if we can use layman's terms, should they be necessary. Is that fair enough? I've known Jeff for about 16 years. I don't think there's any danger of him getting technical. <laughs> okay, <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, well maybe we'll start with you, Grantley. If you could just introduce yourself very quickly, that would be fantastic. Sure, uh, my name is Grantley Smith. I'm the Director of Global Business Development at Shea Global, and I'm responsible for advising our customers on everything from how to automate their supply chain to cybersecurity to what service to go and buy next. Excellent, excellent. And over to you, Jeff. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm the President and Co-Founder of Cybersecurity Compliance Corp. Um, I'm not your average cybersecurity anything. Uh, after a career as a head of finance in larger and then smaller companies, uh, you know, I come to this from a risk and communication background, which really is where where cybersecurity has ended up. So, yeah, good news is this is not going to be a technical conversation. Lee, we're going to have a lot of fun today. Awesome. I really, uh, again, I really appreciate you guys joining us. So I want to kick things off. Um, just something a little... Uh, a little uh, topical, obviously we all heard about the big Twitter hack, uh, and this came up during our marketing meeting, the big Twitter hack that went down this summer, and I was reading up about it again. Just the whole, you know, the, these giant companies, and we're gonna get into FinTech, we're gonna get into more juicy meteor stuff, but I just thought we'd kick things off with this. Um, the big Twitter hack sort of brought up the discussion of these social platforms that have so much of the world engaged, but really when it comes down to our own personal uh, information, they don't really have the oversight to protect us that way. So there was a lot of government bodies sort of stepping in to say, well, this is why we need oversight. So just a really quick question. Did you have thoughts on, and I know that the Twitter hack was actually stopped before it got out of control by the Bitcoin companies that sort of said, hey, hey what's going on here? Because Twitter, I believe, didn't have a cybersecurity officer in place at the time. Um, do you have any thoughts or feelings about that oversight, the social, uh, the social networks that are part of everyday's life for communication, access to information, uh, you know, politics? Is there anything you would like to say to that end on that event? Wow. All right. I'm going to go first, and then Grantley's going to tell you all why I'm wrong. So, Good. Perfect. This is, I mean, it's just there is no substitute for people being aware of what the risks are and of what aberrant behavior is. You know, we talk a lot about frameworks and about practical application of cyber and things that make sense to businesses. But the theme that runs through all of them, including your personal interactions, is, man, there's no substitute for being aware, being educated, um, be having regular exposure to the things that are wrong or bad. You know, you see those deep fake videos and then they play the real one beside it. Pay attention. You know, that's that's what it's all about. The number one root of, of attacks, the number one attack vector is people, whether through social engineering or, or various other nefarious means of getting you to do the wrong thing. Um, no substitute for just educating people. So the tech can be there. Anomalous behavior detection is, is employing AI that becomes more sophisticated every day, mm -hmm. but so do the attacks. And they're looking for low hanging fruit. They're looking for the easiest access point. And no matter what you do to try to shut it down, it's gonna exist for some period of time. And you know those vulnerable people who are not being taught how to watch for bad things will fall victim. So you know the right answer is take the money you put into all of this crazy AI bleeding edge stuff, leave some of it there, put the rest into general education campaigns for vulnerable populations. Yeah, because I believe I believe that hack was instigated by a simple. I think it was the the hackers were posing from the Twitter IT department and phoned Twitter staff and got access to passcodes. And so 
you know, as you said, you can put all of this money into developing bleeding edge AI technologies, but if you don't leave any to sort of educate the people on the front lines at your keyboards, at the phones, saying, hey, these are some simple phishing scams you can look out for, what's the point, really, if you're going to have that vulnerability still within the, the sort of human aspect of your business, right? Grantley, did you want to uh, jump in and tell Jeff how he was totally wrong uh, on everything? No, he, uh, unfortunately, I can't. He's not totally wrong. My, uh, one of the biggest things that I'm afraid of personally, and I remind my kids of constantly, and, and what those kind of hacks expose is the amount of data and the volume of data that is available to people um, when they get through those back doors, through those side doors, through other people's access points. And the amount of information that's published, I, Twitter isn't just for people to, to rant personally. It's used by corporations. It's used by large corporations. The same is true of most of those social media platforms. I, I have a real simple example from a couple of weeks ago. Um, some kids were walking home from school and were yelling and swearing and being generally rude. And a community forum on Facebook immediately posted it. And one mother had recorded it. The video was up within five minutes and the kid was identified within 10. So wow. the, the concept that there's somebody always watching you and that every single thing you put online when we were younger, let's say politely, Jeff, uh, you didn't have to worry about that. Any mistakes you made outside the house didn't come back home with you. And now every single piece of information that goes out online, whether that's personal or whether that's corporate, is there forever and is of value to somebody in some way, probably in a way you haven't even thought of yet. And having that kind of unprecedented access to that information is quite terrifying. And do you, do you see that as uh, getting worse in the future or sort of backing off? Do you think the population at large is becoming more aware of this as, uh, as a potential problem to future personal security? Uh, I, I, I think much as you commented before we started recording this about the ability of millennials to show up on time for things, I'm equally as concerned that their awareness about their personal privacy and the privacy of the information they post has long since gone out the window. Yeah. As, uh, as a hockey coach many years ago, I was able to look online on Facebook and work out which of my 17-year-old players wasn't going to be at the game the next day long before oh. they told me. Just based on what they were posting to their Just pictures. Just based on what they were posting from the Saturday night. Uh -huh. And so, no, I think the next generation and the generation after that have lost all sense of awareness and all sense of privacy, and it's only going to get worse. And when they translate and transition that into the workplace and start sharing business-related information online, that they're not going to think any differently about that either. And that's going to post some glaring, glaring information that, that people yeah. just probably shouldn't be party to or, or shouldn't be seeing in the way in which it's presented. So no, I think it's going to get worse. So do you think so, that there needs, there needs to be definitely Jeff, and I want to ask you a question right after this, there has to be sort of an, a component for hiring, especially to big tech firms where information is gold. You know, that is the, the life's blood of any, any big business, any small business, really that if, if we're sort of, breeding a population, conditioning in a young population, just be like, oh my God, that's funny, share it. Oh my God, let's do a video of this, share it. Is it gonna get harder and harder to sort of, like Pavlovian dogs, to sort of teach them that when you get nine to five, when you've got your suit and tie on, when you're at your computer desk at work, that has to be a mindset that is completely erased. Is it getting harder and harder to train that out of people, do you think? I, I think it's back to Jeff's point of oversight, actually. I, I think there are going to have to be more and more gateways put in place, either through process or through technology, to make sure that those individuals can't do that off their own back, can't do that as individuals without clearing some sort of approval, some sort of gateway, some technology barriers that stop them from just literally leaking sensitive information yeah. without even thinking about it. Sort of like a... Sort of like a corporate version. There was a, an app I read about years ago. It was called Drunk Text. And I think it took over your phone. It, it measured your behavior on your text. If there was more spelling mistakes, if it was a certain time of night, and it would basically say, are you sure you would have to bypass all these things? Are you sure you want to send this to prevent people from sending 2 a.m. stupid text to anyone? So sort of like that, like a, a sort of a corporate version of a drunk text app. So I, think that will, I think that will be brilliant if we could get one of those for Amazon for shopping as well. One that one stops you buying things past 10 o'clock at night, that'd be great. Fantastic. Mm. So the challenge, and you guys have just highlighted something that, you know, you talk about what's good for the individual, what's good for, for the company, but what's good for society runs a little counter to that. And as a CFO who's 
spent a career trying to identify risks that we could take advantage of in order to make money. Be clear, what you get paid for is taking risks and doing things that other people won't or can't. You can't shut that off. So when you think about an upcoming generation, well, the reason they're not going out of the way to protect this, this private information is they don't care. They don't, they don't value the consequences. It doesn't matter to them. Their reputation is not what matters. Getting data out into the ether is actually critical to advancing as a society. How you protect against the misuse is another discussion. But there is this real, and it's a genuinely positive impetus to share more and more information and not hide things away or keep them out of the limelight. I mean, you might have health problems at home. You might have mental health issues. You might have, my gosh, very personal things going on in your life that you don't want people to know about. But unless you're sharing it, advances don't get made. The barriers don't get broken down. As a business, I can tell you that the more data we had, the better we could make our products, the more targeted we could be around providing a service to our clients. We want every single piece of data that we can get around that client base so that we can make a better product. Now, genuinely, we're trying to make more money, but it is all about making sure you're more responsive to that market. If data is not being shared, we will not advance. So it's less about curbing the, the desire or the willingness to share data and more around, as Grantley said, providing oversight where it goes over the line and creates a, a, a problem. And that's that education component. If you can get kids in grade school thinking about sharing as much as they can and need to, think about COVID, sharing your location, sharing what we're sharing information now that we've never shared before. Mm -hmm. We're every minute of the day in order to help the broader societal health. Mm -hmm. But there are limits, and, and so there are technological limits and there are behavioral limits that say, but then don't share a picture of your genitals with everybody you know. <laughs> In some cases, that can cause a problem. <laughs> but it's a behavioral thing. It's, this isn't teach people what it means to share information, but don't make it uh, a problem to share information that needs to be shared to advance society. Businesses are built on it. Advances are built on it. Heck, AI needs that data in order to improve anomalous behavior detection. Yeah. So in the right hands, as the saying goes, problem is, how do you deal with keeping it out of the wrong hands? That's exactly what I was going to ask you, actually, Jeff. I was going to lob up a softball for you and say that, that that's all well and good, but let's take the COVID example and let's think about the track and trace apps that are kicking around globally in various countries. How incumbent is it on the the gatherers of that data to protect it and use it in an appropriate fashion. Because again, access to that falling into the wrong hands where everybody is, who they've met with, when they met with them, how long they were there for, uh, incredibly valuable information to not just other you know, benefactors, but also you know, criminal organizations and, and the like. So where do you put the responsibility for that and how, do you help them do that because they don't know what they're doing? Yeah, so two things. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give you two related uh, anecdotes around it. One is, first of all, when you talk about cybersecurity, you need to cover things through a life cycle framework, which says identify your risk and protect against an attack, and then detect when you're being attacked. That's only three fifths of the equation. You need to recover from the attack, respond to the attack and recover from it back to where you were before. And that all needs to be planned out in advance of any attack, which, you know, says that you're expecting to lose. You expect at some point someone will successfully attack you. And anyone who doesn't think that way is failing themselves and their stakeholders. So put the plans in place now to mitigate the damage. Expect health records to get out. Expect your reputation to, to be published with this attack, you know, article. But take steps on day zero. Know what you're going to do day zero, day one, day two, day three. Know exactly what you're going to do to mitigate the damage and then recover from it. The other thing that I'd say as an example of where you can't control what's every variable, you don't think of everything. And so you need to have that full post-attack plan now. Um, you guys know the lengths to which the U.S. military goes to protect its secret bases, right? We all do. Sure. They lock them down. There's, it's all closed networks. It's, 
you know, all you know, part miles and miles away and, you know, trudge in with your boots. Unfortunately, in the case of a particular base, they failed in one area of protecting uh, what was going on. They had actually allowed people to carry their phones throughout the base. Somebody got a hold of cell phone data throughout the United States, not targeted to any specific people, just general cell phone location data. And sure enough, they saw a concentration of cell phone activity in a wooded area that had no satellite images or other indications that there was a building or people in that area. Mm -hmm. and here were all these cell phone signals that roughly in the shape of a building. Yeah, it was an underground bunker where there was secret research being engaged in that wasn't low enough not to be tracked by cell phones. So obviously they didn't see that coming. Maybe they should have. But you need to expect the attack to come. You need to expect the COVID data to be exposed. You need to expect, expect, expect. So I see the proliferation of solutions where you have tokenized data rather than real data stored within environments. Um, there's an organization that we deal with who uh, genuinely sit on the perimeter of your, your group as a flow through. They take real data in, they exchange it for tokens, the tokens go into your environment. None of the real data is stored in your environment. You are absolutely free to move the tokens around, use them however you want within your environment. Cannot be traced back to any of the data until it passes back through a security layer into this middleware and then back out into the public. So it is a fantastic mechanism for ensuring that if you're the host of that, that data, that operational capability, COVID data, for example, yeah. um, that you're not exposed. Somebody hacks you, all they get is the tokens. So one thing you said there is, and I really like it, it's, it's you know, plan for it. You know, it is, it is going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's when. So to always have the contingency in place of how you're going to deal with these hacks as they happen, is that is that sort of in a nutshell what you were trying to suggest there for businesses? Like be prepared, it's going to happen, and have plans in place for when it does? Oh, no question. You send 100 people home with notebooks to work in their living room where they have a dog who chases a cat, a goldfish that falls off a table as the kids are fighting and pulling each other's hair out and you spill your coffee and click on a ransomware email when you're logged into your VPN behind the firewall. <laughs> I'm happen. sorry, but that's just reality. Like that's yeah, just that's, what's happening. That, that's so, just Jeff's living room. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like a pretty hectic place to be. I got to be honest. Yeah, right. Well, welcome to most people's homework environment where they can't just lock the door against their grade one and grade three students who are virtual learning. Yeah. So in, in that increasingly distracted environment, if you're not planning for a post attack, you are failing your stakeholders. I can't reiterate that enough. And so would you say then with COVID forcing so much remote work and, you know, we're seeing now a lot of companies are just saying, you know, this is the new normal. There are, some companies are just going full remote. Some are going to do a blend of, you know, two, three days in the office, two, three days at home, whatever the case may be. Is working remotely adding to the vulnerabilities of cyber attacks, do you think? And because of all these distractions that you wouldn't necessarily have if you were sitting in your controlled office space? Yeah, and Grant, Grant, Lee, Grant Lee will, will chime in on some of the experiences that he's having with his clients, but there is no question on our side it, COVID itself didn't introduce anything other than an additional distraction to people who become vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Like the attacks for COVID spiked and they're gone. Now attacks just continue. There are hundreds of millions of attacks and only a fraction of them are related to COVID. They just, they, on they go, the world goes, organized crime goes. So distraction, yes. Home environments, yeah, they're not totally secure and that's a problem. But people have been working from home for a long time. Grantly can share some specific examples around just where it's introduced problems. Right. Oh, it's, I, I, I was going to, before I did that, thank you, Jeff. Before I did that, I was, I was going to say, I, historically, or, or more traditionally, I mean, you and I have both worked with small organizations, big organizations. We've talked about government. We've talked about Twitter. The little guys, the, the sub $10 million a year companies, I think historically believed that just nobody was going to bother with them that they weren't worth the effort, they weren't big enough, they didn't have enough information of any value to anybody. And, and you go back five years, they didn't have any sort of a plan. Their idea of a disaster recovery plan was what happens if the server room gets wet. 
and, and how do we how do we rebuild it? it it had nothing to do with cyber security whatsoever but we've noticed amongst just our contacts and our customer base and the people that we speak to um, cyber security is not limited to large organizations with millions upon millions of records of valuable personal data um, they're happy to go after anybody and they're asking for sums of money in, in the case of ransomware as small as $25,000 and as big as half a million. Um, not always necessarily related to the size of the organization or the amount of data they've got just due to the fact that they can cause business disruption to them. And I've got more examples through the people that we've been working with of small organizations being held to ransom one way or another than I have of the bigger organizations. And, and they don't have a plan. They don't have a cybersecurity officer. They don't know necessarily how to spell cybersecurity, some of them. They've been running for 50 years the same way. And, and they're not ready. And is that, Jeff, is that complacency? Is that awareness? Is that just we're, we're small, nobody will bother with us? It's part of all of that. It's also massively confusing in the marketplace. You know, you've got everyone pushing consulting gigs, hire me on my, at my crazy hourly rate and I'll do a threat risk assessment uh, you know, for 15, 20, 30, 50 grand. Wow, and that's no, no remediation. That's just, here's a report one time, go away and have fun with it. Um, it's, I'm a CFO, you, you know, I've spent my career in finance. If you come to me and say you wanna spend 50 grand on cybersecurity and I say, okay, so what are we gonna cut? Can I fire you? Okay, Can I, you're gone, we're gonna do cybersecurity audit, congratulations. That's not an answer. You need to first be in business and be profitable. That is your priority. Uh, and then you need to secure your business based on the, the a prioritization of where your exposure lies. So the real problem that we've got with these businesses is that they don't know where to start. The noise is awful. Buy a firewall. Oh, the number one question I get this summer, and it's ridiculous, is I run a Barracuda. Does that make me safe? I'm like, wow. <laughs> eating it live fish because that could be a pro oh, great barracuda is a great tool it's a great piece of hardware. it's it's not the, it's not the answer pardon my language it is a real problem when you start thinking i'm going to put tech in to protect everything or i'm going to hire a consultant who's going to you know bulletproof me no it, there are cheaper solutions and people genuinely don't know where to get started on the budget that they have i would never make the choice to put 50 grand into cybersecurity in any one of the businesses that I worked in in the last 12 years. That's a pretty substantial statement, okay, given the price of engagements today. But for a couple grand, you can get an assessment done and have a roadmap for where you need to go and then work with your Grantly, work with your MSP, work with your other support folks to take that cybersecurity plan and implement it. You only need the cybersecurity knowledge on the audit side to identify the plan. It's your IT provider and your IT resources that actually close the gaps. Are, are there a number of areas of complacency? Um, and I'm asking this deliberately. It's a loaded question. We're, our business systems are hosted. We don't have any servers in our building. They're hosted. Someone else looks after that, so we're safe, right? Or, or uh -huh. the one that's now very much prevalent is, well, well, everything we've got is in the cloud, so that's okay, right? Someone else is looking after that. How much of that is a reality? And I know it isn't because I've got some real life examples of where that makes absolutely no difference whatsoever to their vulnerability. But is there, uh, is there a sense that those things as assumptions are keeping people safe when they're genuinely not? Yeah. So of course the cloud is, is quote unquote safer because they have a lot more money to spend on security. Sure. But huge, but, we, we literally talked to a group a week ago who had gone through the assessment, scored a three out of 10, and said, we don't understand. Everything is in the cloud. How aren't we safe? I said, well, listen, do you have any idea what your cloud service provider sets in terms of default security? Do you know what elements of your cloud environment are configurable? Zoom had a number of issues at the start of the year around security, but the number one issue was stupid users. And I say that affectionately. People got Zoom with all the doors open. That's what the free version and other simple versions had. They, it was doors open to make it easier to use. But with efficiency comes vulnerability. So the more efficient you are, the fewer controls, the more vulnerable you are. 
the more controls you have, the more locked down everything is, the harder it is to be super efficient and, and easy to use. So yeah, with the cloud does not exempt you from knowing what security that cloud provider is employing and documenting that for your own purposes. Whether it's hosted, whether it's managed in-house, whether it's in the cloud, you need to know what protocols are in place from security point of view by that provider, whether it's an AWS or an Azure environment, or and that you're configuring it, or whether it's a QuickBooks online. I was at a QuickBooks conference a year ago, and they specifically had a session on, ask us about our cybersecurity settings. Ask every vendor that you deal with in the cloud about their security settings. And frankly, if you operate a cloud-based service, publish your cybersecurity policies as a brand, as I'm a digitally safe brand, use me. Cybersecurity is not just a cost, it's actually uh, a marketing tool that you can use to promote your services and benefit Very your true. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing you had said, and you sort of broached it there, and you'd said in one of our early emails was <clears throat> that companies really should not just you know, that lack of understanding, you said you talked to these people last week and they're like, well, we have the cloud, what do you mean? Because within the cloud, all of those settings can be custom done, you know, to, to protect your data, to protect whatever it is you're trying to, you know, keep hidden from the, from being exposed. But you'd also have mentioned that, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, you said something along the lines of companies really need to address the divide between, you know, their in-house staff, their IT and cybersecurity professionals, whether they're in-house or hired from the outside, and the non-IT people. Is that something that companies should be doing more to address? you know, having that sort of bridge built between the two worlds to ensure that the non-IT staff are up to date, up to speed with enough that they're not being that human vulnerability and leaving things exposed? Yeah, I, you know, the whole premise behind what we do is to take cybersecurity and then you score it using plain English, easy to understand terms to, to drive transparency and alignment throughout the organization. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to say that that's some super secret that I came up with on my own and I've patented it, but as an accountant, it's how I've operated my whole career. Financial statements are assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, and expenses. That's pretty simple. NIST cybersecurity framework, NIST CSF, is identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Driving alignment through the use of simple language is the only way to get budget and get things done within an organization that requires consensus. And Grantly, I'd, I'd like to, to, to hear from you about Projects, this isn't new to cybersecurity. I mean, these guys at Shea run massive projects, small projects, mid-sized projects, where they're engaged not just with the tech department, but with all aspects of the business in setting requirements, driving out deliverables, and then working to integrate the solution with the end user. Can you tell us a little bit about how this is just representative of how IT needs to move, period? It's typical of any, any project that we engage on. They're all business system projects they're all related one way or another to the finance department they tend to be initiated by finance but the beauty of projects initiated by a finance department is they tend to be all about risk cfos like yourself jeff you know this only too well it's risk management and it's all about risk management so if you start by talking to finance that's fantastic it have a tendency no disrespect to anybody from IT who's paying attention to this to get excited by new toys shiny new objects and get all carried away with I need more gear I need more gear it does this this light flashes and this button does this when I press it and and they're less about risk and more about advancement CFOs are very risk conscious so when you engage in any sort of a project with them it's all about risk mitigation where is it gonna go wrong where am I gonna lose money where is it going to make things worse, not better? And how do we avoid any of that from happening? And how do we educate everybody involved in the project to make sure we do get benefit from it and, and nothing we do detracts from that? So in our world, that's normal in any project. And I think it's exactly the same in the projects that you're engaging in, Jeff, with, with the stuff that cybersecurity uh, are doing, that CCC are doing, it is, we're selling risk, particularly we, we, when we work in the food and beverage industry, we work with some very, very tenured professionals um, around the consulting in the food and beverage industry, and nobody in the food industry anymore in North America sells food, they sell risk management. And, and it's an entirely different perspective, but it's one we're quite used to. IT departments, I'm not sure so much. Sorry, can you, can you just explain that last point again? Sorry that everyone in the, the food and beverage, just 
touch on that again. They're not selling food anymore. Explain that again one more time. Yeah, no, there, there are so many controls and so many requirements and so many compliance aspects that are mandated. And this is a point you made very early on about whether these things need to be mandated upon organizations or whether or not they can control themselves mm -hmm. in the food industry everything is mandated everything is compliance framework everything has requirements and everybody has to meet those everybody is audited against those but if you fail the cost for a recall is enormous the cost for a failure is enormous so everything they do is about risk mitigation in every single process in their business so they're selling it's a checklist about, more so than the food product yes they're, yeah they're selling all those steps they're selling that they've met all of the requirements to put that on the shelf more so than what they put on the shelf. Absolutely. So That's they're all overtly familiar with the idea of risk and, and that the controls for that risk have been placed upon them by government, by industry, by everybody else but themselves. Mm -hmm. Cybersecurity, nobody's mandating anything. Nobody's forcing anything on anybody. It's do it if you want to do it. Don't do it if you don't want to do it. If you think you're okay, then you're probably not, but you won't worry about it. So and what those groups haven't figured out yet is that it's not how much money that they give, you know, cyber security compliance corp to do the audit, to tell them where the holes are. It's the cost of recovery. If something goes wrong, because the cost of recovery is exponentially higher than, than Jeff's $50,000 audit or the person they're firing to pay for it. The cost of recovery, if indeed you can even recover from a cybersecurity attack, because Jeff will know the statistics better than I do, but I believe last time I checked, 60% of small to medium sized businesses that suffer a ransomware attack don't recover. They fold in six months. They cannot get their business back on track. And that's, if you turn around and say, give me 50 grand and I'll make sure you don't go out of business six months from now. That's, that's a pretty good deal for any sized organization, but, but they're blinkered. It's not enforced. It's not mandated. And they haven't thought about the cost of recovering if it happens and, and the potential, never mind the data theft. I mean, somebody might get their data and they might only have 10 customers and they're not important and nobody else is going to care, but the company could shut down tomorrow. Do you think it's the, yeah. do you think it's that mindset then? And sorry, Jeff, that <clears throat> well, it's not going to happen to me. Do you think that's prevalent in the cybersecurity sort of like, you know, people that smoke cigarettes? Well, I'm not going to get cancer. People who do risky things drive that. I said, well, it's not going to happen to me. That happens to other people. Do you think that there's sort of that false logic when it comes to maybe smaller or medium sized companies? Like, well, nobody's going to hack us. Is that an issue that's, that's out there? Well, that so Brantley brought that up and certainly for a while that has existed as a, as a major block. But, you know, we're picking up trunk, trucking companies now, we're picking up HVAC companies, we're picking up uh, medical research, we're picking up all kinds of different enterprises who recognize that there's risk and that the risk needs to be dealt with. And a $50,000 price tag could be quite reasonable, but it's still way more than somebody will bite. So, you know, we're out there with a $5,000 price tag because honestly, small businesses will not do a $50,000 audit. And yes, if you're with a larger organization and you need to, to do a deeper dive using a deeper standard, absolutely, it's going to cost money to go in and do that. But man, you buy something off the shelf. You buy something that is a simple assessment that points you in the right direction, that closes the, the easy gaps, right? The low-hanging fruit is removed from the equation. That's all you need to do. And when we talk about risk, you can't attract board members today if you can't talk to them about cybersecurity. Small businesses where there's just a founder, yeah, I get it that they are just getting in there and trying to make a living. That's, that's great and budget appropriate, but still spend a couple thousand bucks on an assessment. It is critical. Forget the consultants. Buy something that is off the shelf, that is SaaS-based, that you can leverage off of the work someone else has done. Uh, fill out the survey and use it as your roadmap. But the risk conversation is everything. This is the number one business risk facing people today outside of COVID. It's not just an IT problem anymore. Conversations are happening amongst CFOs when they get together. I know, because I'm in those groups. Um, they know that they need to do something. You promote it as something that helps your brand. You can't compete with certain contracts if you don't have a cybersecurity policy. States are passing safe harbor legislation where you've got a documented cybersecurity policy. Canada is contemplating penalties if you haven't 
done your duty of care around cybersecurity, or if you knowingly fail to publish successful cyber attacks or data breaches, it's all coming. It's just coming slowly. And so forget the idea of this being cost and really work on it as an opportunity. I talked to somebody the other day uh, who runs a tutoring, um, online tutoring service. And I said, you need to embed where you've got an online service, make the first day of every course a half hour how to be safe online program for all of your students. Put that on your website. Tell them that you are embedding security and awareness in your service and watch people choose you over your competitors. It, there are so many different things that you can do as an organization to make cybersecurity a benefit, not just something that you're doing to try to appease some regulatory body or risk appetite. So yeah, this isn't a conversation happening in IT anymore. Uh, another group I spoke to a couple of weeks ago, large organization, risk is moving to internal audit. Sorry, uh, cybersecurity is moving to internal audit. This isn't sitting in IT anymore. This is a risk conversation, and that is genuinely what's happening around the world today. I love that two, two things, like you said, that that is, uh, it should be a huge thing that companies are using to market. You know, that big seal of approval, like this is why our product is safer than others, and it's sort of to make a really poor analogy, but almost back to the food industry where they're not selling food anymore, they're selling that, you know, list of checked off boxes that it's safe. <clears throat> if I'm standing in the, the market and I see two sets of bread, one's $4, one's $2, this one has got all the checks and this one's like, nah, nobody checked this one. I'm definitely spending the $4 on the bread that somebody checked to ensure it was safe. And as you said, again, that, that that's always been that the regulatory base for food safety. Uh, Jeff, I think you said that that's slowly starting to show its face <clears throat> within the tech world. Is that something that we'll see, do you think in the future, all of those things will need to be checked because of that oversight in the coming years? Oh, it's, it's, it's imminent. And the, the challenge that we've had is massive shortage of resources, right? Which causes a problem. Multiple frameworks with nobody agreeing. There's no, accountants are governed by one body in Canada and one body only. Gap in any country is one set of standards. Mm -hmm. um, cybersecurity, there are dozens of frameworks that are all acceptable. There are multiple standard setters. There are multiple credentials and micro-credentials. Oh my gosh, if I hear one more person tell me about some new micro-credential in cybersecurity, that's great. You're employable by the largest company in the world in this one department, in this one job. Congratulations. But that is making it harder and harder to have this conversation about what is cybersecurity? Why is it important? And where can you apply penalties to not upholding a duty of care? The right answer is either safe harbor, right? Where you say you need a documented cybersecurity policy in line with a globally accepted framework or some other form of affirmative control that says, uh, if you can't demonstrate that you have got this through either audit. So uh, in the energy sector in North America, there's a standard called NERC SIP that is propagated as the standard you need to comply with and it's subject to audit. Okay, there is a compliance requirement. If you don't report that you're in compliance, then you are subject to penalties. That will come. That will come in every industry that has any kind of, of, of cybersecurity requirement. Think of what privacy is doing, which is a little bit ahead of cybersecurity in terms of requirements. It's all going to come. It's just going to lag. Get ahead of it with something that's inexpensive, basic awareness training, compliance testing, and an assessment. Start closing the gaps now before it becomes mandated. Apparently, you look like you wanted to jump in there. I can see. I yeah. can see the wheels turning. <laughs> no, I, I, I wanted to ask another question of uh, of Jeff. In in every instance that I've cited so far, um, the real culprit has been human error at the end of the day with, with all of the technology in the world with all of the the gates and the firewalls and the ring fences and the protocols in the world every single instance that we've experienced in the last two years and there have been four or five of them um ranging in significance from completely derailing an acquisition to hundreds of thousands of dollars going astray to entire business systems being wiped out and unrecoverable. Um, but every single one of those stemmed from somebody doing something they shouldn't have done and it wasn't intentional and it wasn't malicious and, and they didn't do it deliberately. They, they screwed up for lack of a better term. They, they, 
they weren't paying attention. They clicked on the wrong email. Um, they, they put the password into the wrong website. We get emails like that every single day. Please log into your Microsoft Office account and hand us your authentication credentials. I mean, thank, thank God for two-factor authentication because when it goes wrong, you get a text message 30 seconds later that says, um, you've changed your password. Please put this number in. And you're sitting there going, no, I didn't. That yeah. didn't happen. Um, but two-factor authentication doesn't apply to ransomware. It doesn't apply to phishing emails. So when how do you protect against your own employees? How do you protect against people? How do you stop that? Well, we all know this. It's, it's, it's implants into the brain that actually convulse the body. Okay. So <laughs> in the future, right, where AI is embedded in our brains, it will do that for us. But there is no answer beyond proper awareness training, proper compliance testing, tabletop exercises. It is about, and this, why do you think people talk about gamifying cybersecurity, right? They talk about it because when you play a game over and over again, you, you start to take in that information as behavior that you engage in, right? You learn, my kids are learning how to play Minecraft. You know how quickly they learn the names of everything and how to make things in Minecraft? If that game was just about cybersecurity, like an escape room for cybersecurity, and we work with a couple organizations that do cybersecurity escape rooms, you, this is what needs to happen. People need to be trained to be aware. Think about, I think about when I was first living on my own university and then in an apartment, and it was drilled into my head that when you walk in the building, you close the door behind you. Yeah. Okay? You don't hold the door open even if, if you don't recognize the person, you don't let them in because of the security concern around strangers in the building and the potential for harm. Well, my gosh, if I could learn that and I'm just an accountant, surely everybody that you know can learn enough about cybersecurity to not fall for the click on the Groupon email that just came to your work account. Now, that's an easy thing to say, but awareness is around things like don't sign up for, for coupons through a work account, you segregate it. You wanna take that to its nth degree, you run two pipes into every home. One that is secure and only used with work devices for work purposes, and one that is used for all of the personal devices and other things. There are so many different ways to slice this. Those options will become standard over time where everyone will have multiple pipes coming into their home at an inexpensive rate. These are the types of innovative solutions that are gonna come along. They're gonna help people ingrain the awareness and build out environments that are inherently aware to prevent the human aspect from causing the problem. Having said that, we said it earlier, Lee, you focused on it too. Prepare for the successful attack. Make sure you've got the things in place that are going to stop the damage immediately and you're going to be able to react to it appropriately. Uh, are you talking about, Jeff, taking the ways approach to cybersecurity? and turning it from a GPS app into something that gives you points when you report where the police are. Um, I'm gonna leave that as your product innovation that you can take forward. Um, you know, the reality is that, that people, are, people need to be the anomalous behavior detectors. People need to be aware and vigilant. It is really training that behavior, knowing what to watch for. We all do it with our kids, we do it with our, our businesses, right? It's all about advanced warning and watching for warning signs. My gosh, we need to be all aware of doing that online in a digital world as well. It's funny yeah. you should mention that because um, earlier on in the day when I asked Lee for the, the connection information for this event, I'd actually put my credentials into the webpage for this event to subscribe to the video later. Mm -hmm. And five minutes after I did that, I got two emails asking me to complete my enrollment for my, I, I don't know, Hoot something account. Um, two emails back to back asking me to complete my enrollment so that I could start my first meeting. And for a minute, my brain went, I wonder if that's related to that. Uh. And that's actually how I should be connecting to this. And then I went, hang on a minute. I've never heard of this organization. I don't yeah. recognize the URL. <laughs> it's got the wrong email address for me on it. Probably not a good idea. But right. you know, back, back to your Barracuda feeding. It's no good. It's no use. It doesn't stop that stuff. And if it's if it's context relevant, it's even more dangerous because it's much harder for those alarm bells to start ringing. Because for a minute there, I thought that was me signing up to join this. 
I have to oh, say yeah. that would have been it would have been very ironic if you had been hacked based on signing up for the cybersecurity panel that you were part of the discussion. <laughs> I think that would have been a beautiful definition of irony that would be well understood. Um, so Lee, I have to I have to tell you, assuming that we still got time, I think we yeah. do, right? Go for it. My gosh, I had we had somebody in our office a year ago uh, came in, was looking at working with us on the sales side. Uh, so we educated him on what we were doing and why we were doing it. He went away, came back two weeks later, genuinely looked me in the eye and said, Jeff, you would be so proud of me. I thought, uh-oh, uh-oh, this is going to be a problem. He said, you'd be so proud of me. I got an email from our president who's in Africa that he is driving to South Africa from uh, another location. They're, they're on safari. They're, they're headed down for these meetings. And he, and he emailed me. And it was him and it was clear and it was his email and I, there was nothing wrong with it. But he was saying that I needed to wire cash to this mechanic because they'd had a problem and his phone wasn't working. It was dead and they couldn't get a charger. So I really needed to do that really like immediately. It was, it was urgent. Um, and I thought, no, this isn't right. So I contacted him mm -hmm. through the office in South Africa. And sure enough, it was not legitimate. So I wrote them back and I told them that I knew that was a scam. Jeff, you'd be so proud of me. Oh, oh my God. So you validated your corporate email. Oh no. Oh no. That's what you did by responding to the attacker. You validated your corporate email. Guess what? That's worth more than a health record. It's worth more than your credit card. That really? Validated a legitimate corporate email, which they can now use to go to all your suppliers, to anybody in the world who can look you up and it's legitimate. Okay, people aren't aware of where value comes from in the cybersecurity and cyber attack chain. Getting that message out is so important. That's, it is amazing how somebody thought they were doing the right thing. To be honest, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, again, cybersecurity is not my forte, but I wouldn't have thought, not, now that you said this, that's huge to me that the validation of your corporate email, that's worth its weight in gold because now they have access to all your vendors, your suppliers, your partners, and different ways of foot in the door to start a conversation that leads to who knows what. And it also and, make, it makes me think that human error, that's, I mean, obviously it's not going anywhere because humans to error is human, who was the famous person that said that. I mean, so it is about as much education as possible because little things like that, this guy thought he was doing like, check it out. He wanted a pat on the back, whereas you were slapping yourself on the forehead. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have to be the CEO's email address. This can be the poor person sitting in accounts receivable who contacts the customers for money every month and one month sends out an email to all of them going, we've changed our bank account information, please update it. Yeah. yeah. It's that simple. Don't I, mean, I, def I, I definitely sent money to, there was a Nigerian prince this morning and it was, I, I know that I'm going to get the money back with 10% on top because I mean, these scams have been around for so long and I think maybe that it's almost like this COVID fatigue another analogy i'm going to try and draw here they're, they're saying there's a fatigue happening right now so people are not paying attention to rules like they were in the beginning that, that things are spiking because they're just they're tired of all these rules they're tired of their life being so different you could almost say the same about certain phishing scams we've seen these email things there's been jokes on saturday night live about them it's been a part of our life for so long that maybe people are just becoming a little more ah no okay they're not as as up to speed, they're not as vigilant as they once were when, you know, the, the web became part of our everyday interface. Is that fair to say as well, do you think? Yeah, oh, I, it's, oh, the evolution from phishing to spear phishing is really what's, what's for me changed. It's not just about here's a group on to click on, right? People have become aware they shouldn't just click on all that stuff. Mm -hmm. really. But it's the one that comes from your colleague. It's the one that is believable. That's based off validated credentials. Yeah. That's, those are the ones that are a little harder and, uh, you know, fatigue to a certain extent, but honestly, we're still just penetrating the market with awareness. So I don't think people are tired of it. I think that they've really just become so confused and inundated and it's awareness never got to them in the first place. Okay. And as you said, spear fishing there, because like they that. never became aware. Yeah. Real. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of work to do uh, and sessions like this, or how we get the word out. I've been doing them all summer to try to get people to, to be a little bit more aware and a little bit more aware is a little bit safer. Yeah. Um, there's a thing happening right now. I must have had 15, 20 of them in the past week. It's a video being sent through Facebook Messenger. And as you said, it's kind of like spear phishing because it's coming from uh, my list of messenger contacts that I speak with the most. 
And it's, it's, it's almost like a custom message, like, oh my God, you won't believe this video I dug up. And then it's a thumbnail that really could be me, I guess, like standing on top of a car. And I'm like, and the first time I said, I was like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not clicking on that. So I messaged the person and I'm getting like two, three a day. And then those people are having to shut down their account, reset passwords and stuff. So it's almost like in this, you know, like any form of evolution as the site, like as the security gets better, as people become more educated to protect themselves and their organizations against these threats, so too do those who are the deviant forces behind the hackers and whatnot, so too are they developing better and more intricate ways to sneak through those. So it's like, it's a game that changes on a daily basis, I would say. Yeah, and that's, why the tech's not, that's why the tech's not the solution. Yeah. It genuinely is promoting awareness and yeah. keeping an eye on your surroundings and looking for anomalous behavior. I mean, AI is going to get smarter and smarter and smarter, but it's basing its algorithms off of machine learning is all off of data. Well, the data is historical by nature. Mm -hmm. It's future oriented. It is learning from the past and applying it to current. Mm -hmm. People have the ability to project forward. And so you need to harness that through better awareness campaigns, more interesting engagement, no different than the virtual learning exercises kids are going through in you know a work a, a learn from home environment mm -hmm. you need to engage differently to get people to think about okay well when this happens it's different than what i expect or what i've seen or what i could imagine this should be that's the advantage of training your people to be that line of defense absolutely the other thing i'd add to that jeff is that every single advance in technology for as long as man has been on the planet has been available equally to both sides forces of good and evil so no matter how brilliant the technology is at preventing something, it's going to be equally as brilliant at circumventing it. It's all about how you deploy it, not how good it is. Well, look at ransomware as a service. Coolest business going today. I built Wicked Ransomware. I made a bunch of money. I'm going to franchise that. And now every, you know, Tom, Jenny, and Sarah can send out their ransomware using my slick little ransomware as a service tool, collect their you know, a couple of points and then send me the rest like a pyramid scheme. Well, you know what, if, if other companies can be software as a service, what the heck is stopping ransomware as a service? Nothing. Innovations are applicable, as you say, on both sides. That was, that was a hell of a, you know, I'm going to ask you, you guys, I love that point, by the way, Grantley, that for every invention, there was always going to be two sides of the camp. The spear, you know, the spear was like, yeah, we're taking this animal down. Protein is coming into our diet. Our brains are going to expand. And there was another dude over there like, well, you know what? I'm going to use my spear after they take down the game to kill that guy to take the meat home. There's always been that flip side of the coin. That was huge. So, gentlemen, I'm going to ask you, and before I do, again, big thanks for, uh, for joining us. Um, <clears throat> for joining this event. Um, if you could, sort of words of wisdom, a little sound bite, like I think you've said, I'm pretty sure I know what you're gonna say roughly, but if you could offer one piece of advice right now to small, medium, large, as Grantley has said a few times, it doesn't matter the size of the company, everybody is vulnerable to these attacks. So another way to put that, size doesn't matter, it's true. Um, okay, so uh, if you could, and we'll start with you, Grantley, if you just have some words of wisdom to share to anyone that's watching this, that has started a company, that works at a company, you know, how to keep yourself safe. Well, I, I, I think that first point that you've, you've stolen from me there in your summary is, is that don't think for a minute that you are unimportant enough not to worry about it and that the data that you have isn't important important enough to anybody else not to worry about it. it. It's not the size of your organization. It's not what business area you operate in. It's not the technology that you have. It's not where your equipment is located or where your services are coming from. It's irrelevant. It's the evaluation of the cost to recover from that mm -hmm. that's of value to somebody that's trying to tear it down. If they know it's going to cost you half a million to get it back, they can charge you a quarter of a million not to do that. It's got nothing to do with the information you've even got. It, 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 as an organization, you should be looking at what it's going to cost you to recover from it when it happens and then invest accordingly. Amazing. Man, Jeff, that was a, that was a mic drop from Grantley right there. That was really well. Everything you had said, that was, that was great. That's a snippet. Well done. And Jeff, over to you. I can't follow that. That's ridiculous. Get out of here, Jeff. Come on. <laughs> We know that's not true. <laughs> this, this, this is dead simple, all right? 
you start with an assessment so that you know where your gaps are. Okay, feeling around in the darkness is not how you fight cybersecurity problems. You have to shine a light on them. You have to know where your exposure is. You run an assessment and then very simple basics. You focus on awareness. You focus on compliance testing. And then simple things like password rules, patch management programs. I mean, these sound like little throw-ins, little sound bites. They're not. Patch management, keeping your systems up to date is critical. Enforcing complex passwords, this is low-hanging fruit. When we say there are easy gaps for you to close, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much. As I said, we're going to look at maybe this being a, a live event in the, in the coming months, maybe next month, the month after. I'll be in touch with both of you because you're both obviously extremely verse, adverse in this or versed in this, uh, this, this subject. Um, and I think it would be a big thing for us to have a question panel going um, uh, at the end just because this is not going away. You know, this is life. This is business. This is how everything is conducted. Um, so it is something that, as you said, is, is the vulnerability of everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what your business is, it's there and it's here to stay. So that's it, gentlemen. Thank you so much again. Um, let me just stop this recording here and then I'll close with you. Hold on. Stop recording.